So, um, hi everybody, thank you so much for coming to the second instalment of the Histories of Capitalism and Race in the Middle East and Indian Ocean Seminar, um, organized by uh, myself, Mateen Bigari, uh, Hengobe Ziai, and uh, Sarah uh, Kazaz. Um, so uh, just, I'll just repeat this for those of you who weren't here last week, um, but one of the aims of this seminar um, is to really build an intellectual community around um, questions of capitalism and race, um, especially approaching the histories of capitalism beyond Eurocentric frameworks. Um, and uh, to do that, we really wanted this to be a non-hierarchical space, um, so meaning that this is less of a lecture and more uh, a seminar for us to sort of all think together and discuss this book, which hopefully you've read um, already, um, and to really have a, an engaged uh, discussion. Um, okay, um, so with that in mind, we really welcome not just your questions, but also um, your comments and personal reflections. And that's also why um, we actually, have this seminar is linked to an MA module here, uh, and we have many of the students in that module in the audience who hopefully will also share their reflections of, of the book. Um, we also have uh, two uh, student respondents um, each week. Um, so uh, today um, we have Johra Althani, um, who is a PhD student here in the history department at SOAS, and also um, Jao Moreira da Silva, um, who is a recently graduated um, MA student um, uh, in the history department at SOAS. Um, just a couple of things to note, uh, the session is being recorded, um, so please if you could turn your phones off, that would be great. Um, also, um, just be mindful that it, it is being recorded and if you, if you want to speak, um, uh, just have that in mind, but also if you want to be sort of cut out the recording, um, you can email us, uh, our email address is there, it's not quite visible, but <laughs> maybe at the end you can um, um, see it's there and email us and let us know if you would like to be cut out the recording. Um, so, um, I will introduce um, our speaker, uh, um, Professor Alden Young, um, um, who will be speaking about his book, uh, Transforming Sudan, Decolonization, uh, Economic Development and State Formation. Um, Alden Young is an Associate Professor of African American Studies and a faculty member of the International Development Studies Program of the UCLA International Institute. Uh, a political and economic historian of Africa. He is the author of Transforming Sudan, which we're uh, discussing today. Uh, Professor Young is particularly interested in the ways in which Africans participated in the creation of the current international order and has research interests on both sides of the Red Sea. Uh, so Professor, Professor Young, uh, you'll speak for 20 to 25 minutes uh, and then we will have our um, student uh, respondents. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just wanted to thank again the organizers, and I'm really excited to be here. I think I tried to take a SOAS module when I was a master's student at another London school, and they told me no. But <laughs> when it was my great, uh, it's been my you know great honor to uh, be speaking here with you guys today. Um, I started to write this book. Now I feel like forever because it's this grew out of my dissertation, and so I started to write this book and. Um, in, 2000, in 2008, when I first went to Sudan. And I think that's important to think about 2008, the period before uh, partition in 2011, um, and that it was this moment, I think I also arrived with a certain amount of ignorance, so it was a moment, especially for people like me, of a certain amount of optimism. Um, and, and I wonder if that, you know, in some ways colors the book. Uh, but I guess I'll hear from you guys whether or not you feel it's an optimistic book or not an optimistic book. Um, and, and, and in many ways, I was trying to tackle these questions that came um, that came sort of from people like Timothy Mitchell, this question of what does it mean to have a national economy? Uh, what does it mean to think of a national economy in a country like Sudan? And what were the legacies of the growth of a national economy um, from the colonial to the post-colonial period? Um, and the other big argument, and this is what had really gotten me, I think, to work on Sudan, um, was I was at LSE and I received one of the worst marks of my career on a paper about Sudan uh, in the Africa course there. 
And I think I received such bad marks because the paper was something like, why, you know, what are the origins of the Sudanese Civil War? Which in this period was still like what dominated much of the literature. And I didn't think that the origins of the Sudanese Civil War, you know, could be framed as a kind of, uh, I was very opposed to the idea that it was purely an identitarian conflict. Um, that didn't make much sense to me. I was like, I don't think this is why you know, wars happen. And so I sort of approached Sudan with that you know, fixed preconception, which may or may not be right. But I was very adamant that this was you know, going to be true as I approached the archive. Um, and in order to do that, one of, the, one of the other big arguments that I felt dominated the Sudanese uh, the literature about Sudan were these books like The Root Causes of Sudan's Civil Wars, which is an amazing book, and I don't think we should talk badly about it. But, uh, but it was a very peculiar book, right? It runs a 200-year history of Sudan, and the periods that drop in and drop out are also very significant. And so one of the parts that drops out is the early independence era um, and the 1960s, right? They're, they're hardly mentioned in Douglas Johnson's masterful narration of Sudanese history. Uh, and why? In part because, you know, he's trying to get from one civil war to the other civil war. Um, and he's narrating it as, you know, kind of an inevitable outgrowth of, a, you know, of the problems already present in the Ottoman Egyptian Sudan. And so, but this was curious to me. And so I also wanted to return to this period. And so the book is sort of focused on, you know, 36 roughly, but really uh, the years after the Second World War uh, into the early 1960s. And I'm trying to make this argument in this book, right, that this is actually a turning point, that decisions, that the future of what a Sudanese economy looks like was not completely fixed, uh, and that the decisions of policymakers at this moment um, still really matter. And I started with another naive idea. I was like, okay, I'm going to go find you know, all these Sudanese economists and their writings, and they would emerge, but I didn't realize that they wouldn't really be there in the 1950s. Um, but I also, in the archive, discovered that what I thought were, was economic policymaking and how it was done was also wrong. Um, and so, in many ways, I thought economic policymaking was, you know, I thought there were these great intellectual debates that would happen, and that was how economic policy making would be made. But uh, I discovered it was really this economic diplomacy. Um, and so many of the officials, they gained their strength, they gained their, their knowledge um, in sort of dialogues. First, in the, cotton, in the International Cotton uh, Consortium and um, in these other sort of bureaus where they picked up a lot of ideas from Latin Americans and uh, and from South Asia, but also, you know, and having to go back and forth to the World Bank, um, and having to negotiate with the Americans and the Soviets, and and it was in this process of negotiation that they were really, I think, uh, developing a lot of their economic ideas. And they were, I wouldn't want to say amateurs, but they weren't usually formally trained in something that we would recognize as economics. Um, a number of the Sudanese officials had been trained in what was supposed to be native administration, and they were moved into economics. Some of them were from the military. Uh, some of the British officials that stayed on, supposedly because of their expertise. Uh, John Carmichael, the most famous one in my book, I think, I think he was a meteorologist at first. Uh, and so this is what economics expertise sort of looked like in this early 1950s period in a place like Sudan. They were gathering people who could be spared from other parts of the administration and sort of developing them. But Sudan became a laboratory, right? So if you join the Sudanese uh, Ministry of Finance, say in 55 or 56, your career was quite bright. Um, and you became leading economic experts not only in Sudan but elsewhere, right? Uh, Mahmoud Bahari would become the first uh, head of the African Development Bank Abdurrahim Margani would go on to the Arab Development Bank, uh, or the Fund for Arab Development in Kuwait. Um, Hamza Margani Hamza would go on to be one of the senior members of the Africa Bureau of the IMF. And so 
it was also a place in which, you know, a limited amount of expertise, this on the ground training because of Sudan's early independence, a relatively early independence, you know, meant that you were going to go on and sort of decide what the ideas of economic development would be, not just in Sudan, but elsewhere. And so I think that made it a really interesting uh, place. But also, there were very few people. And so, as I read in the archive files, both in Durham and in Khartoum and then in the World Bank, uh, you would see that there were only a few names. So that was the other hallmark, is that you know you start seeing like maybe seven, possibly 10 names reappearing. Um, and this idea that these few names could have so much influence on what, um, on what would be decided for the future of Sudan. How would the economy be developed? So, I mean, in some ways, right, I mean, part of the conundrum is that Sudan itself wasn't really fixed. Uh, the borders weren't really clearly defined. Um, even in 50, I usually show another image of, uh, of the Patik Philippe of um, King Farouk, right, from the early 1950s, in which large parts of this are still somehow uh, on his watch, not the Arabian side, I mean, that's clearly gone. But, you know, he sees this as his watch of his patrimony, uh, the borders are being debated, um, you know, in the early 1950s. It's really interesting also in the politics of archives. If you go to the American archives, uh, you see this explosion of Sudan material from, say, 48 until maybe 55, 56, but really around until 54. And it's all on this question of the borders. Where should Sudan be? The Americans are obsessed uh, for a brief period of time, um, and then they rapidly lose interest. Uh, but in some ways, this also is the hallmark of one of the things that was important for thinking about the national economy in Sudan. Where were we going to put this economy? Where was it going to be located? Um, what were going to be the basis of the economy? And of course, one of the arguments I think of my book is, is that it was these decisions to locate the national economy, uh, not here, but in the Jazeera. Um, and in the sort of the central part of the uh, central part of Sudan, that really you know escalates in some ways the tensions that mark uh, the late 1950s and the civil war in the 1960s. And so I, I put this photo on from on the cover of my book. Uh, it's a map of it's a shot of Jazeera from outer space. Um, and one of the things that um, Jazeera is one of two landmade mark. I guess you could call them monuments of the colonial period in Africa, uh, the other being the Rand mines that are visible from outer space. And so the size of the irrigated landscape from Jazeera changed, you know, in many ways, the shape of the earth. It's one of the things that you can see from outer space. Um, and the decision of the 10-year plan in 1960 to greatly expand it, the idea that maybe you could triple it in size, even as cotton prices were falling, it's a very curious idea, and so a lot of the book is about, you know, how do we understand why this was seen to be um, the best path forward for Sudanese economic development? Why would you invest all the money in the Gazira scheme, even as you know uh, that cotton prices are declining? One was that they had no ability to do, uh, and you see them talking about this from the late 19, early 1950s onwards, they can't really hedge, right? They can't really buy futures on cotton. They can't do the kind of financial things that we might do now. So they were doing this without the ability to sort of hedge and guarantee a price into the future. They've lost their long-term contract, which I don't think uh, even many of the nationalists thought they would with Britain. And they've been able to find no um, alternative uh, long-term contractual buyer. So they're expanding cotton into a spot market, right? They're expanding cotton into um, a market without guaranteed purchases. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of throws Sudan, Sudan off. And later, uh, I'd be interested to think what you, hear what you guys think. I mean, one of the problems I think that Sudan has had, Sudanese elites have had, is that uh, they've often made major changes with the expectation that they would receive, I think, more international support than they do receive. So in 56 at independence, um, you know, there is an idea that, you know, first there's a debate, should Sudan be with Egypt? 
important members of the Sudanese elite are like, no, especially the cotton growing elite. Egypt is actually a competitor to them. And the idea that they would grow food for an Egyptian industrial economy is distasteful, um, especially with the Egyptian pound not being fully convertible. And then there's an idea, OK, that we can maybe we can make some kind of alliance with the Americans and the British. But the British, frankly, say no. They're like, you're not really a colony. And we can talk more about whether Sudan has a colony or non-colony. No, you're not eligible for developmental aid. Um, and we don't want your cotton. Uh, and then they try to go to the Soviets. And there's this funny stuff I found in the archives where the Soviets are like, you might be able to get cheese for your cotton from Czechoslovakia, but otherwise, we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and there's some, you know, there's a back and forth. So the Sudanese elite, the Americans eventually come and they say, well, if you sign our military pact against Egypt, maybe we can deal with you a little bit. And of course, this, you know, really upset Sudanese politics, or at least elite politics. And by the time the Sudanese get together to say yes, the Americans are like, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we don't need you. Uh, and I'll see, you know, in the mid-1960s, there's a famous report that comes out, the Quarry Report, and they say, well, we have Ethiopia. Uh, we don't need Sudan at all. Mm -hmm. And so there's always, there's also this whiff of tragedy, right, where the Sudanese seems to think that they're going to be able to get more support than they actually can. Um, and then in the second part, it kind of turns to this, they actually do carry out the development plan, right? So Sudan, you know, at this time is a surplus country. It has huge amounts of its own resources. It's owed a great debt by the British, uh, who, as we all know, the British don't actually pay their, or don't pay their World War II debts on very favorable terms. They pay them in quite disadvantageous terms. But Sudan does have a bit of capital. Um, and it makes a huge investment in the 1960s, right? It expands the railroads. It digs new irrigated canals. It greatly expands the size of the Jazeera scheme. Um, it builds like one of the world's largest sugar refineries uh, with Kuwaiti money. Um, but this all, none of this really addresses what are some of the greatest concerns in the country, right? Which are the vast levels of inequality, uh, the uprising in South Sudan, um, already the beginning of conflict in Darfur. Uh, the decision to concentrate all of Sudan's resources in this central project, uh, if anything, only exasperates. And many of the Sudanese elites in Khartoum had decided, you know, well, this is one of the debates. We don't really know exactly how much collusion there was, but we think there was a lot of collusion in 58 and 59, uh, where the civilian parties hand power to the military. And the idea was that the military would be able to spend these resources on this development project. And you see all this writing, you know, we're gonna move Sudan, we're gonna move the central region of Sudan uh, to make it as wealthy as, say, like Turkey. Um, to do this, they have to marginalize the vast majority of Sudan. And you can see a kind of racialized coding, um, even in what they mean by development. So uh, development plans are, you know, countries are listed, but not all countries. I mean, you can basically see that this country is being listed kind of in the major, I guess you might say, racial categories, right? The US is at the top, then some of the Arab countries in this sort of middle region, and Sudan is ambitious to get to the Arab countries. Um, and then the African countries, like Tanganyika, are sort of pushed to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue is about closing that gap, right? Uh, can we take Sudan? And this is the time of Walter Rostov. So people actually, this is American propaganda at the time was that, you know, development was like an airplane. So if you speed up the plane, uh, it'll take off, right? It'll reach some kind of lift off. And so the idea was, you know, you're going to lift central Sudan <laughs> like an airplane, and you're going to move it from Africa uh, to the Arab world. Mm. And of course, this is all a little bit, you know, uh, looking back, we might be like, well, that's a, that's a kind of silly idea. Um, especially when we know that the great wealth of Sudan uh, was in uh, livestock. We know that the private fortunes that were really large are in livestock. Uh, livestock exports are still very competitive from Sudan. Uh, 
livestock exports are actually what the Arab countries want from Sudan. They didn't want cotton. Um, but it was hard to do that also, I think, in a racial imaginary, right? The British had said that most of the livestock was uneconomical. Uh, there were um, questions about investing in South Sudan. Many of the northerners, one of, I think, the biggest mistakes was the decision that to join the Sudanese bureaucracy in 55, uh, you had to pass the dual exam, both the English and Arabic exam. Um, and Arabic had not been taught in the southern schools. Mm -hmm. And so already from the beginning, people are being locked out uh, of the possibility of joining the bureaucracy. And many of the northerners, they had never been to the south. Right? So Azhari says that you know, he was, his images of being completely frightened on arriving in Juba. He says there was a riot. Uh, but we don't think that, I mean, it doesn't seem like there was a riot. Basically, he was in this room of Southerners and he got a little bit afraid. Um, but they had never been, so in a way it was also, and you can see in the archive that it's really hard for them to send uh, graduates. So they want to send university graduates to South Sudan to manage uh, and report back on the schemes that they're trying to take over, but they can't get anyone to go. Uh, People are refusing these posts. People are running away. They have to import uh, people from India and Pakistan to do some of these jobs. Uh, and so the difficulties of managing the entirety of the country, I think, also uh, weighed heavily on um, the decision to invest in the central regions. Oh, yeah, I just want to show you a photo of, of Hamza Mergani Hamza, just because in many ways, in my opinion, and you guys can tell me if this is true, he's sort of like the hero of my, of my story. I don't know if that comes through in the book, but uh, you know, he knows early in the late 50s, he's like, look, this cotton scheme thing is not going to work. Uh, he's like, uh, he has export pessimism. He's picked up some of the ideas from Latin America. You know, he kind of gives you a kind of, uh, I don't know, fully developed form of, what do you call it? Uh, what we might see as dependency that the terms of trade are constantly declining and we need to diversify. Then he comes back as the Minister of Finance after you know, working in the IMF, and this becomes a kind of a familial story that we might see in other places, and he executes austerity, so I guess that kind of takes away some of his heroic position. But, uh, but it also begins another idea that I think haunts a lot of Sudanese politics into the present, which is that we don't have enough money to develop the whole country. And you see that, you know, you saw that in late NCP politics. You see that uh, going forward, this idea that we can only develop a part of the country and the rest of the country will have to govern through uh, alternative uh, approaches. And just finally, I would like to say that, you know, it was interesting. I wrote this book in some ways. Uh, in my mind, I had, you know, finished kind of a African history PhD. And I wrote this book in many ways fighting against kind of identity. Uh, or I wrote the dissertation, not the book, as much. And it's something I want to share from you guys. But then I got my first job in African American studies, or black studies. Um, and I was, of course, then challenged with, you know, how would this book, if at all, talk to those kinds of concerns? Um, and that might be part of the politics of, you know, the US. Uh, what, what gets read where? Um, and so, but I think they were right, right? I mean, in many ways, uh, the development discourse in Sudan could not, of course, be deracialized, right? I mean, it's racialized from its very front. Um, it's racialized in the US when it was, you know, in places like the US where it was developed. Um, and then, of course, it's picked up and then added into the racial frameworks uh, that were already present in Sudan. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, my time in black studies has taught me. They also made me director of Black Studies my first year, so so it was a it was a baptism by fire. But uh, but, um, but yeah, but I'd be interested in seeing uh, what you guys think. Well, thank you very much. Um, so now we'll have uh, Johara. Um, we'll offer her reflections. Um, yeah. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank Kenny and Mateen uh, for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, and I'd of course like to thank Professor Young for joining us here this evening and actually earlier this morning with us since we're recording a podcast to accompany um, this talk, which I wanted to uh, invite you all to listen to once it's all been uploaded. Um, 
as part of this ongoing conversation that we've been having um, over the past few weeks regarding particularly the impact and legacy of colonialism on different economies and institutions, uh, your work, Professor Young, focuses on uh, sort of the late colonial and early independence periods, uh, particularly within the 1930s to the 1960s, and contributes to this discussion by really examining these state apparatuses, not as solely uh, ones of exploitation of the state, but also as part of a particular decolonizing context where many of the policy makers that you discuss in, in your work um, are defining and creating a blueprint and constructing the boundaries around which they can operate and form policies, uh, which is very different from the typical narratives and the histories that we have, particularly of Sudan, but also of other countries in the region. Uh, from the beginning, you discussed, for example, uh, the Jazeera scheme, and that's, of course, uh, discussed throughout your work. Uh, you also show that this kind of conception of uh, a unified economy <laughs> is in itself um, uh, is in itself a part of an ongoing discussion and construct within these developmental frameworks and these developmental narratives that are. Um, that are coming in, especially during the post-Second World War period. Um, and a couple of sort of the main arguments that you do discuss within your work that, that really stood out to me Sorry, in particular, no. sure, um, that, uh, that struck out at me particularly in your work is uh, this, con this idea of marginalization not only being sort of a racial one, but also being tied to these developmental policies. Um, and really uh, mirroring many of the biases that, that are within the communities themselves. The focus on, for example, the, the riverine <laughs> areas, as opposed to um, looking at investments in, uh, in more of the peripheral areas away from the center. Uh, and essentially reifies uh, the divisions that are found within society already. Uh, and secondly, you also demonstrate uh, the perspectives of these bureaucrats themselves and of these ministry officials who previously were not really actors within the discussion. You know, it's often spoken of as part of you know, you have a ministry and, you know, they're connected with the elites and these are policies that are hangovers oftentimes from uh, colonial legacies, whether that's Ottoman or British. But you do demonstrate that there is an active and agentive aspect to, uh, to their actions and the policies in which they're engaging in, even if in certain instances they do mirror previous colonial legacies, but that these were thought through in uh, many instances and were part of a context uh, from which they were emerging within this decolonization moment. Uh, w when it comes to reading this as part of my own work, we discussed this earlier this morning, actually. Um, but one of one of the key aspects that really struck out when thinking of your work is uh, of the of the greater impact that Sudanese professionals, particularly in ministries, or who were trained through these civil service uh, programs impacted other areas in the Arab world, particularly in the Gulf, uh, which is where I'm from, but also where, uh, which is the region in which I'm working in. Uh, one of the key aspects that I was thinking of is the fact that so many of these Sudanese professionals were engaged in the establishment and the running of uh, a lot of the ministries uh, during this overlapping time period in itself. Um, you already mentioned Kuwaiti investment into Sudan, but there is a relationship that develops. It's not only sort of this developmental narrative of foreign direct investment into the country from potentially wealthier from or more economically wealthy countries, but that there is a, there is a relationship that happens the other way and what are the impacts uh, that this has on other regions. And particularly in, in a moment where <laughs> it's overlapping, you know, in the same time in which they're trying to configure 
um, their own development, their, their own developmental policies, their own economic policies. This is also happening concurrently in the Gulf with similar actors and similar figures and people who are coming from similar backgrounds, particularly central riverine and Khartoum, <laughs> you know, Khartoum elites. Uh, the other question I also had, or not a question, but this is the other comment that I also had was that you really demonstrate the impact of new sources and archives and what that can provide us uh, when examining, uh, examining an area and how to engage with these new sources or these archives or to reread older sources as well um, and to examine how how does the current literature, or how does current historiography engage with a particular region? And what can we as historians extract um, from these sources? And what do they say? And are they similar? Do they speak against what's been written? And that's something that, um, that you provide you know, a very interesting roadmap to look into. I did also have a few questions <laughs> that I'd also like to pose. Um, for the discussion, but also uh, to yourself. Um, the first, which is self-serving, I admit, <laughs> um, is do you see a connection between, um, I know you, you discuss the marginalization of race, but do you also see a nationalizing identity formation project that emerges as part of the discussions of these developmental policies? Um, and were they, you know, when they were being proposed with that part of the consideration, you discuss, for example, the vast differences and oftentimes the lack of access to language within the South. But oftentimes, for example, language is used as a tool to bring a nation together. Following on from that, do you see any resistance to these policies that is happening either in the center with uh, the changing of the landscape of, for example, a Jazeera? but also in the South with the lack of development that, that, and investment that is occurring. And then the next question I have um, concerns the current situation in Sudan, and especially like a post Bashir Sudan, and what that looks like. Uh, you have an economy now that's looking at capitalizing on industries that are focused on these previously peripheral areas. So, you know, you have the Petroleum and mining and animal husbandry are all part of um, the margins, really. They're not centrally located. They're not in Jazeera. They're not very close to Khartoum. They're not really riverine. Um, and yet only, for example, I, I think it's around 5% of the GDP is estimated as being as coming from taxation, around 5%. Um, but all of these activities still utilize state apparatuses and they're still utilizing, you know, for example, infrastructure, local infrastructure and um, international connections. Uh, so how would these previously domestic oriented production or forms of production become, and, and the fact that they're now becoming more outward and export focused, uh, how do you see your book engaging in conversations with these kinds of shifts in focus? Thank you very much. And, uh, Joao? Right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, before starting, I would also like to thank Hanny and Martin and Sarah, um, both for inviting me and to uh, invite me to be part of the organization of this seminar, which has which been great. And it will continue to be great for the next week, so I hope everyone comes. <laughs> uh, um, I might be a bit biased. <laughs> but uh, before asking um, my questions to Walden, I would just briefly make some remarks about what I thought were the biggest uh, merits of the, wo the work from my perspective. Um, so in short, uh, by challenging narratives which conscript themselves to strict timelines and geographies, as well as approaches solely based on identity politics, conflicts more than politics, that, as Alden said, um, he provides the reader with a clear picture of how the post-colonial post Sudanese state was shaped through the economic policies enacted by the government financial officials in the 20th century, in the 20 years after the Second World War. Uh, so, while reading Transforming Sudan, it becomes clear how the decisions to allocate resources in the 50s and 60s uh, were based on an economizing logic. So, this idea of governing by portraying the economy as a natural and unquestionable concept and development as its ultimate goal. Uh, 
um, which was fundamental to imagine Sudan as a nation state, as an economic unit. Um, so amongst many other contributions from this book, I would like to focus on a particular aspect stressed by Alden in the introduction and <coughs> throughout the whole text, to be fair. Uh, so while explaining how finance officials in Sudan employed an economizing logic, Alden emphasizes this spread of new types of cognitive infrastructures um, amongst policymakers throughout the, go the Sudanese government. And I found this concept of cognitive infrastructures, uh, which you employ, um, very interesting as they were the types of imaginaries impressed into the tools of government, uh, which can be traced. You give two examples to the national development program and the assumption of the nation states as a unit of financial analysis. So, um, as I said, I believe this idea of cognitive infrastructure is particularly important to study the, to approach the study of the action of officials and bureaucrats, in my opinion, both in Sudan and elsewhere. Um, as it rightfully portrays the discursive context in which they were acting. So by analyzing the bureaucrats' actions and as answers to specific questions posed in their own time, um, it becomes evident that these ideas of economic development, national income, GDP, the cost and benefit logic were answers to questions posed by a global context in which nations should compete with each other as these economic units. Um, so. As such, uh, Alden displays in chapter two how the finance officials were immersed and conscripted to these cognitive infrastructures, uh, the language game of globalized concepts of development, while planning, for example, the Nuba Mountain Cotton Cultivation Scheme, the Equatoria Project Board, and the regulation of river traffic on the southern stretches of the Nile. Um, so through these cognitive infrastructures, which put concepts of development at the heart of Sudan's nation state formation, the country began to be imagined as an economic unit. Um, that said, while reading about these cognitive infrastructures, which created Sudan as a nation state through the idea of the economy, and most importantly, the centrality of natural res resources such as cotton and water in these projects, I wonder about the finance officials' approach to nature, to ecology, uh, and that's what I'm going to inquire about. Um, the recently passed away uh, philosopher, French philosopher Bruno Latour, uh, employed this theory of modernity, who, by displaying how the modernizing efforts, uh, which I would include the Sudanese officials um, here, divided the world into this realm of humans and this realm of non humans, this realm of, well, you can say society and nature. And by employing this division, modernizing efforts try to dominate the nature. So humans would dominate the nature, nature through this process that Latour coined as purification. Um, so through this process of purification, ecosystems were changed and destroyed, um, and nature was also produced through this destruction. So um, as modernizing efforts claimed the domination of humans over nature in order to profit from the exploration of lands. Um, so I believe that Alden's book uh, although this is not the main focus, I believe, of the book, it greatly displays how this dichotomy, this process of purification, persisted in post-colonial Sudan, uh, placing the nation development through the rise of cotton production as one of the main objectives of this project. The government ended up shaping ecosystems through a seemingly untouchable political order. Um, in, other, in other words, it wasn't only the idea of development and nation-state that were naturalized. So was this idea of domination of the nature. So, our present ecological crisis, uh, marked by the worrying consequences of this alleged control of humans over the natures, is enough proof, in my opinion, that such dichotomy was a mere illusion and framed by modernity. So, looking at the case of Sudan during this time period, I wonder what Alden's, what your impressions uh, are on this matter. So, based on your research, what do you think was the importance of this division of the human and the non-human, human nature? in the government's plans, and consequently, how central was the element of ecological disruption to the crisis that came up in the years after? Crisis which, you, as you emphasize, cannot be solely explained, explained on identity. So, I guess, in short, how, was, how central was this societal domination over nature an aspect of the Sudanese bureaucrats' were, cognitive In my mind, I guess, as I was starting to write, were, uh, there was Eve Chow Powell's book, um, her first book, which I can't remember. Shade of 
another shade of colonialism, in which I think she she takes up directly what you're saying, Joe. I mean, right? One of the ideas of modern of, of modernity. I mean, in her case, she talks about Egypt, right? She says, you know, in some ways, Sudan played an important role in late 19th century, early 20th century Egyptian uh, ideas, concept, Egyptian elites' conception of themselves as modern as the proof, right? I mean, the proof of Sudan, Egypt's ability to dominate Sudan, you know, plays into this role, allows Egypt to claim to be a great power. And you see this a lot in the dialogue, in the writings of Sudanese, uh, nationalist, um, you see someone like Meki Abbas, right, who had come back from Oxford, where supposedly he didn't do that well, but it didn't matter. Um, he was able to become, you know, the first Sudanese head of the Gazira board. And what does he say, right? Uh, or Mergani Hamza, who was Hamza Mergani's father, who would become the minister, the first minister of irrigation, water and irrigation. Um, their big complaints, right, were that the Egyptians have been undermining their ability to correctly use the Nile waters. And that if we were only able to use the Nile waters, uh, I, I often call it, I have to think of it as water nationalism. If we were only able to use it, right, we'd be able to use it to our full potential and we'd be able to develop. Mm. And we'd, we'd, you know, be able to move forward, right? And in a way, this was the robbery of colonialism. And so I think you get some of that and the, you know, the very formation of Sudanese nationalism, at least at this kind of, uh, at this kind of level where they were either anglicized or, you know, they had been trained in places like Egypt, uh, they're picking this up, right? I mean, they're completely invested in a kind of modernity that uh, revolves around a domination of nature. Uh, and the use of those fruits as proof of, you know, uh, your ability to be civilized. Uh, and everyone is involved in it. I mean, I have, this, I have this really funny series of dialogues in which uh, they bring in two Indian experts uh, to think about the monetary policy. And these guys are always writing about the British guys next to them, and they're like, why are their houses bigger than mine? Um, you know, he's doing da da da, and I'm doing da da da, and so much of it is about these kinds of very petty disputes. Or the English are sitting there being like, I'm not getting my pension, and I'm going to be forced to live at the level of this, you know, Sudanese bureaucrat. And so there's also, I guess that would be the other thing I would say, there's a kind of class uh, distinction going on, right? And so there's an idea, not just of domination of nature, but there's an idea of what is a proper I guess maybe we would call it middle class life, but a proper a proper lifestyle, right? And that lifestyle requires uh, this huge expenditure of resources to make it possible. And the Sudanese elites at this time were not above thinking, I mean, they even gave themselves special electoral uh, seats, right? The graduate seats, uh, because they were pretty convinced that those who had gone to high school and perhaps university, you know, maybe our opinions are a little bit more important than uh, other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, this becomes one of the, the hang-ups. How do you create uh, a lifestyle that is recognizably middle class, uh, that allows you not just to be in charge in Sudan, but to be globally middle class, right? And so there's this question of kind of uh, joining your peers uh, sort of abroad. And this might be the downside of economic diplomacy, is that the first thing you do is you go out and you see that you're part of a kind of group, right, a class. Um, and that class has certain um, lifestyles that need to be maintained. Um, I mean, ecological collapse is, of course, something that I think is, is, is always, I mean, being discussed, but even the Bashir regime, I mean, what did they do? They built new dams. They built dams in places that they knew they weren't supposed to build dams. Uh, but, I mean, they were learning from the Egyptians who also built a very huge dam in a place that they know they're not supposed to build a huge dam. And I've seen, you know, you can see the colonial documents from the 1920s. Everyone knows where the dams should be. And so it's not like these are, uh, this is like, you know, it's not like requires new rocket science, right? It's like, 
we all know where the dam should be, but everyone has their own national pride. Everyone has other reasons that they put dams where they put them. And the Bashir regime was very proud of increasing electricity in Khartoum. Um, but it's also very hard to tell someone that you shouldn't have intermittent electricity without an alternative, right? I mean, I've lived my whole life with electricity. I, I'd probably be upset if somebody was like, you can't have electricity. So, I mean, this development project is still very much at work um, in places like Sudan. The expansion of electricity is still something that is being worked on. And so it's very hard, I think, to also you know, not build some of these. Um, no, for sure. I mean, marginalization is happening in so many different ways and so many different levels. Uh, there's a marginalization of, of, there's a class marginalization, of course, there's ethnic marginalization and racial marginalization, and just spatially. Um, but also, one of the pernicious legacies, right, is that, you know, if you go to the ethnographic museum in Khartoum, um, and you see presented to you all these different suppose it tribes uh, and and they're not presented in the best of light right I mean even when I was doing my research people would be who they call it rotanas uh, you know like dialects that are uh, not Arabic right and then um, and they weren't speaking of very well uh, and so I think this you know this this marginalization is right there um, from the very from the very beginning. Um, and then, yeah, and of course it was a national identity formation project. I mean, I think that was, um, I mean, I think this is where I get, you get back to this kind of cognitive infrastructures, right? I mean, if you, and this is one of the points I'm trying to make, right, is that if you had studied economics or, you know, studied development economics or went to the World Bank seminar, are uh, read like Ross styles, like stages of development. There were certain things, or any of the modernization theory that was so popular at this time, you would be, it wouldn't be a leap that you would decide, right, that, oh, what we need to do is we need to create a nation. Uh, we need to force this nation to do savings. Um, so, you know, forced savings was clearly the recommended strategy. We need to extract from traditional production, no matter how efficient or productive that traditional production was, and we need to pump that money into the modern sector. Um, and this, I mean, this was a pretty clear formula, and the Sudanese in many ways picked that formula. Uh, and so I think one of the other points I was trying to make is that picking this formula up is not a sign of corruption. I mean, this is what you would have been told to execute, and that required huge amounts of violence, right? Because how are you going to carry out four savings? How are you going to get the savings rate way above 5%? I mean, I think it's supposed to be like 20 something percent. Uh, how are you going to do this in, in 10 years? Um, who are you going to get these profits from? Mm. And so to do it, you had to, uh, and I think Masjid al Jazuli says this often, right? Everyone knew you had to basically steal from peasants. Uh, you need to take their, their profits and redirect it uh, into state industry. Um, and this formula, you know, is very hard within the developmental frameworks of this moment to challenge. Um, yeah, and I guess that goes into, uh, uh, did you have a, you had another question or the last question? Um, so I had the one about sort of nationalization and identity construction. Oh, okay. um, I also had any questions on resistance or any any discussions oh, yeah. around resistance and um, so sort of post Bashir, how how does uh, the current economy and its focus or the government's focus on the economy connect with your text? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you see post Bashir, so you see confirmation that perhaps the richest parts of the country are not in the center. Uh, but you also have seen the emergence of elites who are able to direct to directly interface, you know, with the outside world, not coming from the riverine section, right? Um, and so you see the exploitation of places, of, 
resources from places like Darfur that don't have to be mediated directly mm -hmm. through Khartoum. Um, and you see the emergence of state actors. And here I think UAE is particularly interesting because UAE, more than others, seems to be willing to like deal very directly with sub-state actors uh, without even the facade of trying to hold together a kind of national bureaucracy. And so I think you're seeing a lot of that in the present. Um, but this, and I mean, the wall calls it like a marketplace, but I don't know if it's a marketplace as much as, but I think he's right, that there's this huge development of elite uh, from regions that, you know, I think the 1950s and 60s elites would have thought they could successfully marginalize. I mean, they never were able to actually do the marginalizations that I think they thought they could do, but now it's, I think, becoming uh, even more difficult. Great, thank you. So now I'm going to open uh, up to the floor. So the way it's going to work is that Alden is going to have a rest for 20 minutes while we actually have a discussion in the room. Um, so feel free to actually come back on each other's points uh, and share your own personal reflections of the book. Um, and then um, Alden will come back um, to um, come back on the discussion. And then we'll have a more formal Q&A um, for those who have more direct questions um, that Alden will then answer more directly. Um, so yeah, please raise your hand um, if you want to speak. Uh, hang on, man. If there's nobody else, but also feel free to ask you know questions that Alden will you know answer in twenty minutes. I've got I've got lots and lots of um, questions, but I won't ask them all at once, um, but maybe just to get the conversation going. Um, your book has been so formative to me, um, and I use it a lot in my own um, work, so I'm really, really glad to be able to discuss this with you um, in person. Um, I think some of, the way, um, some of the ways that you've sort of framed it now in the discussion, I think almost doesn't do justice to your own argument. Um, so for instance, you said that, um, you know, development discourse uh, was, was racialized, whereas I think actually in the book what you're what you're showing us is not just that development discourse was racialized, which I think many of us here, at least at SOAS, I think maybe we, could, we would agree with, um, but it's the very sort of technical tools um, and devices that we understand to be neutral um, in, in the quote unquote science that is economics that have racialized assumptions sort of embedded in them um, and also therefore sort of racialized effects. So of course you, you talk us through um, uh, statistics, you talk us through planning, um, income accounting, national income accounting, um, as these sort of, um, I suppose, devices um, for organizing economic life. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of throwing that one out there as a kind of provocation. Is it fair to say that these, these things are sort of racialized in and of themselves? If that is the case, then um, can we also um, reach the conclusion that there's nothing exceptional about what's happening in Sudan here? Um, you know, in this kind of building of a national space through um, through the economy. But it's just sort of one colonial uh, laboratory that throws into relief the way economics and these economic sort of devices and techniques and tools um, reproduce um, sort of racial sort of disparity and are racialized, you know, even in the, you know, metropole and, and global north. So I suppose that's the first thing that um, I'd want to sort of put out there. Um, just to share a second reflection, we'll ask our students to gather some of their own thoughts. Um, it, is, it, is it fair to say that um, one of the central arguments that you're making, um, you know, this idea that the sort of telos of people's political imaginaries um, during the moment of decolonization wasn't necessarily, you know, the nation state. You know, you're contributing to a literature that you know, has been, has been talking about this issue in recent years, so I'm thinking of Frederick Cooper, I'm thinking of Gary Welder, but the thing that you seem to be doing that they're not is that there's a degree of, um, I suppose, predetermination in the foreclosure of all these other possible ways of organizing post-imperial polities um, that, that you show us here, right? Um, and the foreclosure is precisely because of this um, economic discourse. Right, so you've called it a, a cognitive infrastructure. Um, there are maybe other ways we, we could think about it, you know, economics becoming a, an order of normative reason, 
Um, so that sort of actually ends up um, cr shutting down all these other possibilities for sort of political arrangements that, that could emerge. Um, so you're pushing us to pay sort of greater attention to, in, in some ways, the power of, of ep economic thinking and economic reason, um, something that portrays itself as sort of neutral and objective, but actually um, has been politically extremely uh, consequential. So yeah, would you, would you agree with that um, reading of, of, of your intervention? Uh, yeah, Mira? Um, thank you so much for the talk, and, and um, I thought Henny's comments were also really thought-provoking. I really enjoyed the book, um, the bits of it that I managed to read, which was not all of it, so forgive this question if it comes from a place of ignorance, and also forgive me for not for just posing another question to the speaker. Um, but uh, I suppose I wanted to open the question of where economic interests come in the story. So you tell this a very persuasive account of how the cognitive infrastructures of, let's say, national economic planning and the development discourse of the time, um, you know, create the, the boundaries within which, I guess, these elites are operating. But one of the things we, I guess, we kind of classically ask is what is the relationship between money and power in the state, right? And so, and if you like a sort of one line of Marxist thinking is that the state is always an instrument of the economic bourgeoisie, but what's interesting in your case is that actually the major part of the economy, the place where people have their wealth, which is livestock, is being totally ignored. Which for me is puzzling from that perspective in which you would expect at least some conjoining between state infrastructures and the, and the economy. And so I was wondering how your, your case kind of reflected on that relationship between the state and capital. Um, because you've got this kind of I guess maybe odd situation in which capital, the wealth that is out there is not really recognized as like real capital or like meaningful economic activity, which poses all kinds of interesting questions for political economy when you're thinking about how the state works and who it works for. Um, because if these guys are just like, let's say professional economists disembedded from the merchant classes or the trading classes or the, you know, whoever's wealthy in Sudan, um, is that an aberration or is it more normal? Um, is it, you know, is the, is the discourse of this professionalization doing the heavy lifting or is there somewhere, if you like, old fashioned economic interests playing a role? Um, did someone have a hand? No? Okay. Just uh, Gabriel? Sure. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but I just. Oh, Mira. Mira. So I, I, thanks for raising that question. And I wanted to bring it up as well uh, to Alden. Um, because uh, I was just wondering if it was something you thought about as you were going through the archival material and you're reading all these finance officials and you know they portray all of their activity. I, I imagine that these guys usually do a very neutral language in the language of budgets. Um, and you've gestured towards you know the, the marginalizations that did come about as a result of their policies. But um, I'm just wondering if you you found yourself still reading a kind of class position for many of these many of these officials. Um, or maybe even uh, class interests that they're not even necessarily themselves aware of that they're acting on behalf of. So I think, I mean, I just read the intro on some of chapter two, but you, you mentioned that they ended up favoring basically projects that brought the most revenue to, to the central state. Um, I don't know if that ends up favoring certain kinds of business interests or land interests, um, but uh, the, and then I think one thought that for me comes from that is that, um, they're creating the economy, as you say, but they're also, as, and one way we can also think about the economy that uh, came out of Prince Lodian's book was that it's this um, space out of democratic governance, and that's a, it's a fundamental, like that's the, you have to encase the economy outside of, outside of democratic contestation. But it seems like for, also, I don't know, I'm just wondering, for, for these guys, if it's also encasing the state outside of democratic contestation, and, and I mean, they're all elites, obviously, so, Maybe that's just kind of baked into their assumptions, but it's also the work of marking out this this thing as a kind of neutral space, as opposed to acting on kinds of the kind of class interests that, that Mira was talking about. I just wanted to put that up. Not really for me. Um, I love this, you know, <laughs> and I, I thought it was a very interesting tool. It's been a couple of years since I read the book, so I kind of was wandering to my memories of the book as much as I'm responding 
Um, but one of the things I really like about your book is, you know, I think in development studies we often think about theory as like a wave that comes in and out. And you're kind of showing how theory is kind of contextualized and, and the work that's done around it to make it happen. Um, and I was struck when you were giving the talk today that you were talking about um, how in the 1950s a lot of the people who were involved in economic policy making were not professional economists. So I wanted it, you to say a little bit more about the kind of establishment of economics maybe in Gordon College or the University of Cartagena that you've done. Um, and the kind of, you know, I've, I've been writing this paper with Moz Ali at the moment about uh, kind of contemporary economists and how international organizations are so formative in their training and the way that they think and that we kind of contrast it to an earlier period when there was more pushback against sort of these international financial institutions. But the kind of story you're telling is, is more about the kind of, uh, a kind of space where there isn't a strong positions where people are kind of um, in improvising and sort of thinking about, you know, the needs of the economy and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the dominant theories of the time. But I wanted you to talk a little bit more about a kind of hardening of the domestic economist intelligentsia, whether that comes out in the archives. And then the second comment was, I wondered in your archival research if you came across people involved more in social policy. Um, when we think about um, like Catherine Boone's work about uh, redistribution regimes in the independence era and how structural adjustment undo them, undid them. I mean, in your book, you talk, you're talking a lot about economic investment, but I wonder how that interacted with social investment and whether there was a kind of a balancing act between recognizing that when it came to commercial infrastructure and economic infrastructure, it was very centralized, but when it came to social infrastructure and health and education, you know, whether there was more of a kind of cross-subsidization. Um, and I think one of the things that I, I think is very interesting is thinking about racialized capitalism, which I really got from your book, was the way that things became entrenched over time and kind of ideas about deserving and undeserving groups, you know, how economic theory kind of built on to what was the kind of economic patterns of the time. But I think social policy is part of that story in terms of either countering that or deepening that in terms of the tax net and who became beneficiaries. So I don't know if you came across social policy conversations, but I think that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Sarah and then Joanne. Great. Um, fascinating book. Thank you, Colton, for, for coming and for sharing this conversation with us. Um, I guess I want to pick up on both of uh, Henry's and your comments as well. Um, because one of the things that really kind of stopped me as I was reading, um, I think actually was a little bit almost opposite of what Henry was saying, or at least a step before that, which is to say that, you know, there are parts, um, and especially earlier on in the formation of this cognitive infrastructure, when you see real tension, right? And I think a lot of people in our field kind of skip over the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and don't really kind of focus on the moment where these experts and these planners are truly formed, right? Um, and I, I remember when I was reading um, the section on sort of the Nuba Mountains or the, the Equatoria projects in chapter two, I was really struck by like, you know, there, there's quite a bit of, there's a lot going on there, right? I mean, it seemed to me, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, um, before we get to a real kind of consensus around what the development project should be. Um, and I thought, you know, the questions that came to me as I was reading this was, one, it's super refreshing to take a step back and like really kind of delve into these tensions and think about where they're coming from. Um, but also, what is the benefit for us as people who think a lot about, you know, what are the processes through which knowledge becomes ossified and kind of notions mm -hmm. that become ossified in particular ways, um, 
in taking that step to think about sort of you know the opportunities before they get foreclosed right mm -hmm. and what do they create are they creating something as they become foreclosed mm -hmm. that maybe we don't give a chance to actually see and, and maybe this kind of um it was really kind of part of what i was thinking as i was reading this um but of course also the flip side of this is interesting because a lot of the tension is through an exceptionalization of these groups that is very racialized. Um, and so it was, it was interesting to kind of see the, the racialization of these economic concepts through the tensions that we think of as maybe perhaps sort of serving these local communities, but you only serve them by racializing them outside of a particular project. Um, so anyway, these were just something that I thought was was really exciting about the book and, and wanted to see if I was reading too much into it, if you want to kind of push against that a little bit, um, or, um, or maybe just open up a conversation about it. And John Michael? Um, first, I wanted to thank you for uh, coming here uh, and giving your talk. Uh, I thought the book was really interesting in terms of uh, your source of uh, the sources you looked at, uh, because you focus most of the work and the materials on the Effendia. Um, and the sort of bureaucratic thinkers, and you stressed how their perspective had not been focused on historically, and how by doing so we got a very different perspective on you know what Sudan is in sort of a uh, nation, and how that process is deeply involved with you know the sort of economic spheres. Um, and my question isn't really against this reading, because I think you do a good job of illustrating on how it's important and how it's integral. Um, but I guess I sort of want to question the sort of limits of this perspective because the, it is a very limited perspective in terms of what people in Sudan are doing. Like, uh, the, no, the number of people that you talk about is quite small. Um, and I wondered how sort of subal subaltern sources and subaltern per perspectives, I know in class we talk about it's only men sort of thinkers. Um, I wondered how that, um, obviously that has a large impact upon what happens, um, but I wondered how as a historian, how if there's a sort of way in which that sort of focus can still change how you s tell the story and how you see the history. Um, I just wondered if uh, by focusing on these perspectives, we, we might get a very different perspective of what Sudanese economy is, and I, I obviously, <coughs> of course, if you looked at those sources, um, your perspective would be different. But I wondered how you, as a historian, you know, kind of focusing more on these middle class, upper middle class bureaucrats, contends with that sort of other history that isn't in the book. Mm -hmm. Did you have another? No. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was really, really enlightening. I just wanted to ask, you spoke about how initially um, Sudan didn't receive much international support for development, it didn't, wasn't eligible for developmental aid. Do you think that Sudan's economy would have taken a better turn had it received developmental aid? Because like, historically, in particular with regards to colonized countries, it doesn't always work out beneficial to the nation if they have, when they do receive that kind of international support and aid. But do you think it would have been different for Sudan? I mean, like Sudan did better than other countries, considering. Okay, um, uh, so yes, and then, I mean, we have Est Esteban first, actually. And then, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, well, my question is also about uh, subaltern characters. Uh, Alvin, you visited us uh, like some five years ago or so at my previous university, and um, I remember I like, asked him this question or a similar one back in the day. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been, been thinking about this for five years. <laughs> uh, no, but it's interesting that uh, the, 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 the tone of your perception about the influence of uh, racial thinking has, has changed since, right? Like that was before you published the book. I'm guessing that was a moment closer to how you felt after writing your dissertation, then how you feel now about it, and um, and uh, and then as a Latin American person, I, I couldn't help but also building 
contrast and connections, right? Uh, it's a period of deep uh, economic changes in Latin America too, that are very uh, much informed by international F uh, IMF and policies, right? Um, we have the Chicago bonds that come with those ideas on how the macroeconomy has to, the numbers of the macroeconomy have to go up regardless of how people feel about it. But at the same time, we have the people feeling about it. The people going to the streets and saying, well, you know, we are suffering of impoverishment by your policies. And, uh, and there is a pushback back and forth several times in, in different ways, right? So we go from a logic of um, industrialization of the economies, which uh, proved not to be very productive, to more uh, welfare states that you know are concerned about people's disagreement with policies. And then we have in the 60s, right, big revolts that are worldwide um, famous. So the question would be like, to what extent um, this economizing logic is shaped by people's reaction right, to um, a, a mentality based on microeconomic uh, numbers that is, yes, it's led by local characters, right? Um, and, and I appreciate like pushing back against the, like the uh, dependency theory like, throughout your book, right? That is still uh, pushing for it. Uh, but at the same time, they also represent um, uh, world trends, like uh, macroeconomic trends. Uh, yes? Thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. Um, I come from development studies, so um, um, first of all, maybe history, in history, as a historian, you always think history, of course, matters economy, but it's not how mainstream economics still sees. They don't really see the role the history plays, so I think it's of um, such a contribution for economics uh, scholars as well. Um, also, uh, the first point that the lady <coughs> made about how mainstream tools that, that these policy makers used um, were sort of assumed to be working. And I'm doing um, research, a study on labor market access in Sudan, in rural Sudan, Kodofan and Rahat. And exactly the idea of employment, what is considered informal work and formal work, is is coming from Khartoum, or maybe from Geneva, where ILO set the idea of work. And when I compare that to the idea of what people think of work, or what people actually do in terms of activity, they don't match at all. But then we still use the ILO framework to understand what's employment. And of course we have, what, 20%, 30% female employment rate in Sudan, where women are working so hard, harder than men. Sorry, but you know, so um, that brought me to um, that is, I agree with the way you definitely framed. Um, also, in the introduction, you mentioned about how cotton sales are controlled by the officials, so they knew exactly how much it was produced, whereas nomads, that wasn't the case. And yes, nomads, they only stay in certain cities at the end of the rainy season, I mean, during the rainy season. They go, they return. So it's really difficult to track their move as well. But I wonder how do they become from there to be become the agent of Taiwan today as local lo local defense, especially in the Kodofan area. That's a big jump, and I don't know how that makes sense in historically. So I'm just curious. And the last point is um, you. In our acknowledgement, you mentioned about your work and how staff in National Records Office were very supportive of your work, and you mentioned about a lady with a Western name. But uh, when I went there um, during the revolution, um, I believe that lady was no longer there. And um, I was, my research is about labor. And the only thing that has to do with labor in my head was uh, slavery that was available in National Records Office. And I couldn't access. You know, they were like, no, you can't. So um, I was just curious to see how, I mean, you, pro you didn't you go back to Sudan recently as well? Yeah. So I, I wonder if you also saw a change in the institution, how, you know, as a national record office, how did it change in your eyes, knowing them for over 10 years, 
2008 point before you know separation took place. Yeah. Uh, I'll have two two more and then we'll bring Alden in. <laughs> yeah, you done? Yeah. Uh, yes, some people in your book you talk about death and how some people are despondent. And um, I have a question uh, writing from the discussion we had in the afternoon. Just like both this week reading, the author assigned another uh, classical article to by Nietzsche, like the fixing the economy. So, uh, it seems like in Nietzsche's article, he uh, actually said like the very notion of economy. Sorry, you don't, can you speak a bit louder? Just a bit. All right. So, in Nietzsche's article, fixing the economy, he, I think he actually said the very notion of the, the economy was actually, um, how to say, emerged or gained its new meaning in the very recently period, like the middle 20th century, which was actually like the core time period of this book is focusing on. I think Nietzsche like, uh, reminds us that we should like pay attention to that, like the seemingly like, economy, which like urges us to consider it as like a still content spell, like wants to like ex exclude the state and like the household or like the uh, subsistence, subsistence section of like subsistence, subsistence sector of the production or labor to exclude from the economy is not like it's not like true and we have to like critical against this so actually he considered the economy um, as like a tendency to separate between the uh, modern or more modern sectors and like the traditional or domestic sectors. And I think like in the book Transforming Sudan, he also like used that kind of concepts Michel has once used to like to uh, explain that why the national economy puts too, puts much emphasis on the like the cotton schemes because cotton schemes can be considered as like the modern export sectors. However, like for example, the raising stocks they might consider it as like the traditional <coughs> or domestic labors which cannot be counted into the modern national e income accounting. So like my problem here is that we have already like real realized the, the kind of critique we share offered us, but when we are actually doing the research, are we just like uh, reiterate the thing he has been criticized, for example, while we are using the national income accounting, such kind of statistics to do the research. Are we still like treat the economy as an object? So this is what I am uh, confused about. Because we know the shortness, the roundness of this mindset, but it seems that when we are doing research, we cannot avoid such of track. So it's like a question. Thank you, Yudan. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll just keep it quite brief. Um, thank you um, to our guest speaker and to the panel <coughs> uh, for organizing this. Um, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm not quite savvy about um, a lot of this. But I am Sudanese, and um, my great grandfather used to work in the Jazeera project. And uh, his son worked on the Jazeera project. So it was a huge deal to see the success of it. And when it failed, it was quite devastating in a lot of ways. Um, but when they, when they migrated to Sudan, it was sort of like the, uh, the American dream in Africa. It was seen as the land of opportunity. There was quite a lot of um, uh, economic benefits. But you know, as the years um, go on and as history shows, there's quite a lot of um, um, 
complex and uh, economic uh, um, disasters that, that happened in Sudan. Um, when I look at your title, Transforming Sudan, do you think that it's, that, um, do you see this as something that's ambitious um, to look forward to, to, the, to a, a new, um, new opportunities in Sudan? Or is it something um, that, like many other nations, many other economies, that it simply takes time, it has its own pace, um, things will happen? Um, and certainly, you had, you know, Sudan and many other countries have achieved a lot <coughs> from um, their colonies. They certainly have, you know, um, developed as much as they, they, they could have under under um, um, under the influence of, of the British Foreign Empire and others. So yeah, Alden, would you like to come back? <laughs> Whichever <laughs> comments or questions you. I guess there are so many questions. Um, <laughs> no, I'll start with the last one. Um, what was your name again? Jalila. Jalila. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no. Uh, and this is a great question. So, I mean, I of course was my first book, so I didn't get to choose my title, uh, Transforming Sudan. But I think uh, <laughs> uh, Cambridge told me it was search engine optimal or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they always but, say. <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice the first time, but uh, but I think it's a great question. I and I think it was something that I struggled with. I still struggle with. Uh, sometimes I think my advisor would be like, "You've come in really optimistic today, and you've come in really pessimistic tomorrow. Uh, you know, where are you standing on this?" But I, but I think you're right. I mean, I think wait, we have to admit. I mean, and I think that's something I'm trying to recapture uh, with all the kind of while well, holding some of the foreshadowing at bay. That uh, there were huge achievements, right? I mean, in the 1960s, Sudan especially in the central regions, does uh, greatly, you know, from what we can tell, if we believe these statistics to the extent that we can. Um, you know, it does raise, raise living standards. Um, and, and there are huge investments, investments that are still the biggest investments in the country to this day. Um, it's sort of similar to, I guess, writing about the Bashir period, which I haven't done formally, so I don't have a clear answer, but you know, if you lived in Khartoum, right, and during the Bashir period, perhaps your living standards did rise, right, at some point. But where do we, you know, what do we put into that? And there was a Sudanese dream, right? I mean, um, and I think the Islamist government was, to the extent that it was popular, it was popular for a while because it was fulfilling part of that Sudanese dream um, for some people, at great cost to many other people. But, uh, and I think that is something that we have to, uh, that, that bears acknowledgement, right? I mean, that, you know, that it was not all failure. Uh, and that, you know, it's kind of a struggle. How do you progress under heavy constraints? Uh, I mean, and I think, uh, someone was asking me about the value of history. Uh, oh, I think one of the questions for, that we can take away from history, right, is that is that one these these were these were contested issues, right? I mean, they were not fixed uh, in time. I mean, this is a classic historian move to think that everything is contested and contingent um, at all moments in time. But uh, but I mean, there were huge arguments, and there was possibility of imagining alternatives um, at certain moments. Um, and there's like you know, even in the ministry, right, like. Even within the small group, and I and I admit that this is a primarily a study of a small group, um, people don't actually agree, uh, and there's like you know, wildly different ideas about what could be pursued, um, and so I think that's also something to keep in mind that this that the future can change, uh, the past was changeable and the future can change, and I think by by sort of sitting in that contingency we can kind of see ways. Uh, for, um, but I mean that might be me being optimistic. <laughs> but but I I am an optimist, so I believe that you know there are possibilities forward. Um, um, yeah, and then um, okay, I'll just maybe try to go through some of them. <laughs> uh, no, Henny, I think you're completely right. I, I probably just you know I think in some ways the part of the book that I'm furthest from now is kind of the STS focus, which was at the core. Uh, though, 
I'm very proud of that SDS focus. I just, maybe it's not where I, my head is in the, in the moment. Uh, but no, I mean, I think what I was trying to say, and this was perhaps the argument, uh, even the reason that the book focuses on a few people, right, is that it was really designed as kind of a test, right? I was trying to prove in a way that many of these officials actually, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it this, played it straight, right? Like. Uh, they took the tools, and these were new tools, right? National plans, right? Sudan gets to do national planning. It's originally excluded uh, from the it is excluded from the Colonialism, Development, and Welfare Act, right? Because Sudan is not a colony, right? Sudan finds itself at the time of nations in a very precarious place. Sudan is an agency uh, with some weird office, the Sudan office here in London. Uh, supposedly staffed by private citizens uh, who just happened to be British uh, and mostly recruited from Cambridge and Oxford. Maybe, I don't know if anybody got to go from the University of London, but, uh, and they were recruited for their sportsman acumen, right? So they weren't, they, explicitly they were looking for non, we weren't looking for academic stars, right? They were looking for second class uh, academics but first class athletes. Um, and so, and so Sudan finds itself in this precarious position, right? The contract says that it's owned by the British crown and the Egyptian crown jointly. Um, and so what is it, right? And so it becomes an extreme case for some of these problems of nation formation, right? Uh, what do you do with this territory that's not a colony, that has two sovereigns, um, that has a private administration, um, that has a private company that seems to own most of its infrastructure. Um, and so how do, you, how do you proceed, right? Uh, oh, and this is, I think, the most curious part, and this is why I think is really interesting, um, is that right now we might say, we might be kind of down on some of the economics um, and even the discourse of economics and the tools, but they were used, they, I mean, if you had been a Sudanese nationalist, one of the things, or an African nationalist in general, one of the things that economics held out uh, was that it was much better, or it, it held out a potential of equality that was absent in the previous discourse, right? Uh, the previous discourse was much more anthrop anthropologized, right? Different peoples had different potentialities. Mm. And this was the other classic problem that Sudanese officials are running up against, these closed districts. Uh, so the British, right, had closed off large parts of Sudan um, under the idea that they were protecting peoples with differential potentialities. Um, and they were delivering welfare in many ways according to those uh, estimations. Um, and this rankled nationalists in the center rightly, right? I mean, what if somebody comes to your country and tells you you can't go to Birmingham because <laughs> Birmingham people have different potentialities uh, and you know you won't be allowed to sell there. Um, and so, you know, in a way economics held out this potential, this possibility that no. Uh, and it was a radical position to think that producers, African producers, uh, can produce according to market logics, uh, and this was not. This was not always. I mean, the colonial government had deep suspicions that this was not true. Um, I believe this was not true. My advisor claims that in African history, we really decided this might be true in '72 with uh, A. G. Hopkins, uh, uh, an economic history of West Africa. So this was, you know, very much a contested idea in the 50s and 60s. And so I think in that way, economics, you know, while often used actually to kind of reinforce older hierarchies, was, being, was also being used to challenge uh, hierarchies. And so that's, a kind, I think, one of the tensions that's there in the book, and for the actors themselves, right? Uh, are they... Uh, you know, they're challenging the idea, for instance, that the Nuba needs special protections. But doing so, they're also maybe allowing those who have more to take over 
you know, those territories. And so this becomes this, this becomes a, this becomes a kind of driving tension, I think, in the, in this period. Um, but no, but I mean, but I think the biases are also built into things like national budgets, national plans, uh, development plans. And it was protests that allowed Sudan to be included, right? I mean, uh, Sudan gifted Britain five million pounds uh, for World War II. Um, and it's only protest and political activism that allows Britain to say, okay, well, we won't pay you back but we will allow you to begin development planning. And development is supposed to be the recompense for you know, the sacrifices that loyal Sudanese peasants and farmers made to the British war effort. Um, I mean, already this is problematic. I mean, what does that mean? Why is this the way in which you're gonna be paid back? But a lot of the book then takes off on this question of how do you decide who's worthy of being, uh, where will this compensation go, right? Since it is kind of a recompensation. And this whole apparatus is built in many ways to, uh, to adjudicate these questions, as Sudan itself is becoming independent. Mm. Um, no, I mean, there are a lot of economic interests at play. I think one of the things that's interesting in a place like Sudan is that the state itself comes to have so much economic power, at least in this early period, that it finds itself often in actual conflict with uh, private enterprise. And they inherit a strong bias against private enterprise from uh, the Sudan political service, um, which I know, I mean, to those of us living in, I guess, the current England, it sounds kind of weird, but you know, you see them writing and saying things like, ah, these private businessmen are gonna waste scarce resources doing stuff, and we need to stop them from doing stuff. Like, we need to deny them credit. Uh, we need to shut down entrepreneurs. Mm, we can't give money to villagers, right? Because, you know, if you give villagers money, they're gonna waste money, they're gonna have a wedding, or they might like buy a refrigerator. Uh, you know, and so there's four savings is really important. And people are not making their way, at least in this first period, they're not making their way into senior positions uh, primarily, I mean, they are in a way making their way into senior positions because they're wealthy, but, but they're also within this service, right? And so the civil service in a way has a, has a kind of autonomy built into it. And then later in the 1960s, you'll see the civil service, civil servants, quickly learn a different logic, and they start uh, accumulating land themselves. But this is, this is still coming toward, towards the end of the period, when you start seeing uh, civil servants use their civil service positions to, um, uh, to grab, uh, to grab uh, productive land, um, and using loans to do that. But that, that sort of coming in sort of the mid-1960s. In this first period, the idea is kind of suppression, right? You want to suppress, uh, you want to suppress private loans. You kind of are laying heavy on private business. Um, and you want to funnel the savings into the development projects controlled by the state. The biggest tensions are where the state can't control development. Um, the state is very, you know, antsy about projects in which it's not able to, uh, to see uh, properly, and it can't see that well because it can't get officials everywhere. Oh yeah, I'll wrap. Uh, and Laura, uh, how does it go? No, you're right. I I think also it's a lot of. Uh, it would have been a different book if it was written in a later period, right? Uh, like a decade later, I think you would have seen um, there would be many more. I guess, quote unquote, economists, intellectuals, many more people with uh, PhDs and masters. Um, uh, Saad al-Din Fawzi was the first, uh, but he dies, unfortunately, very early in the 1950s. He comes back to the University of Khartoum. I think he's there for only two years before he passes away, very untimely. He's the first Sudanese person to have a PhD from Cambridge. 
um, and he was supposed to found the I mean, the Faculty of Economics at University of Khartoum. And so, uh, you know, in a way, there's not, there's some unfortunate things that happen, but but also, I think that in a way, it's more open because uh, it's not so it's not so defined yet. Um, and they're also ignoring a lot of people, right? So there is an alternative discourse happening uh, from the, you know, Sunnis Communist Party or the Anti-Imperialism League and stuff like that. But, you know, I can see them saying, we're not going to read that stuff. Uh, we're going to lock out a lot of the intellectual work that's actually taking place in the country. Uh, and I think, interestingly, a lot of, and this is probably one of the other reasons that the crisis over where investment happens, becomes so acute, is that a lot of the welfare schemes are built into the productive schemes. And so, you know, um, that's how people are receiving all their benefits, is being members of one of these uh, supposedly productive schemes. You receive, your schooling is paid for by it, as well as your health and other social services. Um, and you see a lot of activism happening actually on these schemes, right? The tenant rights. Um, and the idea had been that you wouldn't have, the late British idea, Gatskill, I think, his idea would have been that you wouldn't have peasants, right? You would have tenants. Um, and so you would be a partner in this, in this scheme. Uh, and as a partnership, right, uh, the government would sort of tell you what to grow or you know, provide you the access services, you would take a share of the profits, they would take a, sh the company would take a share of the profits. Uh, and so, and so th they become these sort of deserving uh, uh, citizens, right, uh, through these memberships. And you see this even, I remember I was in Sudan the first time and I think I had to have dental work and someone was like, oh, I'll take you to the police officer's hospital. And I was like, what's the police officer's hospital? And it was like, oh, well, you know, the police have the right to this dental service. Um, and so you see some legacies of this kind of thing, right, persisting. That it's because you're a member of this, this unit, this productive unit, that you also have these social rights. Um, I think I might have missed the last part of there. So in case, uh, I think now if you have um, questions, that you want to quickly ask to Alden. Um, I think we'll just des dedicate a few minutes to do that. I just have a, a quick question, um, which is that um, you, you talk about the, these competing discourses of development, um, but one thing that struck me was that they all have this idea of um, this sort of more uh, transitive view of development, of there being an object to develop. And it's interesting because in Sarah Farsi's book on Familiar Futures, she talks about this period also seeing the rise of a more intransitive sense of development of the people developing. So it, was there this other discourse of people developing and the need to sort of train people, for example, in the Jazeera scheme <coughs> on how to be productive? Because um, it seems like it's more about just focusing on this object that we can maximize productivity out of. Um, yes. Um, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I think uh, you've already answered this question, and I'm just going to very selfishly um, ask you to repeat some of it again. But if you could very quickly just you know flesh out a little bit of uh, the the dichotomy between capitalism and racialized uh, economy, uh, so to say, uh, because. Uh, Right at the outside, as the, the way you've been talking about it, it seems like it was the economizing logic which, at a later stage in the process of its becoming, sort of turned out to be a racial, uh, you know, project. Right, uh, sort of moved into this racial paradigm. Uh, whereas, you know, um, so so and, and as Henny, I think, was also talking about it, uh, was was saying that. Uh, could it be that it was sort of probably built into the very idea of this economizing logic? Or um, was it at a later stage that you know this sort of just came into being um, but just by, by way of its 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 you know process if, if I think it makes sense? Yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, thank you for being here. 
Um, I wanted to ask you if, I, I was curious to know um, whether you think um, Sudanese nationalism or maybe potentially um, Pan-Africanism as a nation building project um, potentially beholds the capacity to overcome how Sudan has been racialized into a social, cultural, hierarchical structure. Um, it, it, it's, I was just thinking like, why is it that when it comes to Africa, um, there is this like limitation in one social imagination, um, like when it comes to the possibility of um, bringing people into a unified identity. Um, because like, for example, in a Western European context, they have these like theoretical notions about like the Hobbesian social contract and people transcending um, something to the state and creating this kind of collective unified um, sort of entity. Um, and so the, the antagonism that exists between um, the, the adult influence north and um, the sort of so-called like sub-Saharan African South. Um, sure, there's absolutely a, an antagonism that exists there, and there's a conflict, but there's also like more widely in Africa, like the narrative of, of France Fanon, like contributing to um, like fighting against French colonialism um, in Algeria. So, yeah. Um, and also, just one last thing, um, in the context of Sudanese politics, like what do you think decolonization um, means exactly? Uh, because like within the contemporary area, sorry, excuse me, within the contemporary era of um, like an independent and like post-colonial Africa, um, I utilize the term post-colonial like very loosely, um, like thinkers, like states, policymakers, and agenda setting institutions are quite ambiguous about what decolonization means precisely in terms of how it informs and shapes the developmental trajectory that African countries could potentially undertake. Um, and also actually, um, there is this like narrative or perspective which suggests that um, nationalism, but like more specifically African nationalism um, as a phenomenon is an exemplification of like a desire to reflect or imitate um, Western modernity. And so like it was mentioned like about um, the notion of the, the Sudanese nationalists, like they wanted to get accessibility to water. Uh, you mentioned it was like water nationalism and how that would contribute to like a domination of nature. Um, so often like as a consequence um, of people being wary of that, um, Africans are encouraged to like pursue alternative development. And there was a lot of that sort of narrative being perpetuated um, like in the aftermath of like COP26 and people talking about um, environmental, um, sorry, excuse me, environmentalist concerns um, in African politics and stuff, and people saying, well, you know, for the for the sake of, you know, saving the world from ecological disaster, that Africa now has to pull away from industrialization or modernization or anything of that nature, like no manufacturing for you guys, like, um, you know, uh, so. Yeah, I, I, if it is the case that like we cannot pursue African nationalism, we can't like pursue protectionism or utilize tariffs to like protect our infant industries and protect like our farmers from the the precarity of, of the um, the global economy. Then like, what what do we do? Because for example, you mentioned how it seems very unfair, like on the basis of morality, to tell like poor, underdeveloped African countries that, sorry guys, you can't, you know, can't pursue this industrialization thing because like we, we have to think about the global like agenda of saving the planet. But also I want to mention that of course, like ecological disaster is very important and like being mindful about environmentalism and sustainability is very important, but it's just very difficult as well. Okay, great, so we have uh, five minutes left. Um, so, <laughs> so, so feel free to uh, respond to some of the questions just raised, or also some of the ones that you didn't get to address uh, previously, but I, I'm afraid we've only got five minutes. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, 
you raise a lot of interesting points. I think they're all really important. Um, yeah, I'm actually working on a new project. Uh, it looks at a Sudanese intellectual named uh, Muhammad Abu Qasim Haj Hamid, and, um, and he does a lot of the things that you're you're describing. I mean, one, you know, in the 90s, he's calling for a greater horn of Africa, uh, which I guess would go from Mogadishu to Khartoum, and he says, you know, uh, but he also spends a lot of his time fighting in the Eritrean liberation struggle, you know, first in the, in the ELF, which I guess could be seen as more more Muslim organization, and then the EPLF, which I guess could be seen as like Marxist Christian. But, uh, but you know, he, he dedicates his life to this project of Eritrean liberation. So I don't think we should, uh, no, I don't think it's, you know, impossible, for instance, to imagine alternatives to a, a, a kind of sectarian Sudanese uh, state, or that nationalism has to resolve into that kind of uh, sectarianism. Um, but the project of building this is quite difficult, and and I think uh, I think in Sudan, like in many countries throughout the region, there is a colonial state that lives on, um, and that you know, if maybe if many of these officials did something, I think one of the tragedies is that they used economics and. Uh, in some ways, to revive, to attempt to revive a colonial state that had already perhaps run its course. Um, and that these institutions, you know, haunt us into the present. Uh, so what is the SAF, for instance, the Sudanese Armed Forces? Why is this, you know, one of the central institutions of the Sudanese state? I mean, you know, it is, comes from the Sudanese Defense Forces, the colonial army, it's purged of some of its members, its Eritrean members, and it keeps on going, right? And um, and these institutions maybe are not easily reconcilable with a more democratic uh, future for Sudan. Um, but taking them apart also risks taking apart whatever is left of the <coughs> state apparatus. And so you find yourself in this very tough, uh, tough, tough position. Uh, um, and then, um, yeah, and racial capitalism, I think, is... I never really use this term, racial capitalism. Um, not that I'm opposed to it, but but it's not like, you know, it's not native to me as one of my... Uh, as one of my terms. So I work in a department with the person who perhaps repopularized racial capitalism, uh, Robin D.G. Kelly. So, uh, but... Um, but yeah, no, I mean, just to say, I think, I don't think, and I, and I hold to this, I don't think that, you know, these figures were explicitly trying to reinforce a racial hierarchy, though I can't prove that they weren't. Uh, but I don't think that's necessary, right, to believe that. Um, I think, though, the way the capitalists the way the economic system was set up, if you were going to run the, the economy, which is, you know, in the 50s is basically what's left of infrastructure that's built for the imperial economy, you were invariably going to reinforce uh, racial disparities. And the way that they justified it was they said, you know, we will run this and hopefully we will run it fast enough. And I mean, Fanon tells us this is a bad idea, but you know, you're going to run it double time. You're going to run it faster, and we're going to make extra profits, and then we're going to be able to pull the others along with us. Um, but how do you do that, right? Um, the only way you can do that is if you intensify exploitation, right? You can intensify exploitation of nature, or you can intensify exploitation of land. Um, I mean, of people, but uh, but you have to intensify the exploitation if you're going to like make these super profits to then pull everyone else along. Um, and so I don't think these figures had a way out of that. They didn't, I mean, some of the dissent, the dissent is frequent, even within the ministry. And the dissent basically says something along the lines of, guys, this is a really bad idea. We can't just run the cotton machine faster. The cotton machine is leaky. So it's like we're losing money on it from the very beginning. Uh, 
and we need to diversify. And we see this also in you know, the Anti-Imperialism League's writings and stuff like that, Haolo Bernamage. Uh, you know, if you read that pamphlet from, I think, the late 60s, early 70s, it basically says we need to go to the villages, we need to ask villagers what they can produce. We see that we can produce all these things, and so we need to diversify <clears throat> the economy, um, and particularly into the richest regions of the country, which we know are the West, uh, the South, and parts of the East, right? This, this circle is where the productive capacity is, uh, but, but that's scary, right? Because to do that means you have to take money away uh, from what right now is the main profit generating engine for this central state and start giving it to regions that you have less, less explicit control over. Um, and, I'm oh yeah, I'll just say one last thing. And people ask about the rise of the militias, right? Well, the militia form becomes one answer to this dilemma. Um, you can contract, it's, we found that you can now contract out to militias that supposedly are pro-state or opposed to the state, doesn't really matter. But you can contract out to them many of the messy tasks of production in the peripheral regions because these militias will harvest the profits and you know pay a share to the uh, central government. Great, thank you so much, Alden. Um...